Hey everybody, it's Phil Ralston from Sunday's 10 o'clock service. I am at the Mijos restaurant at Durango Station. The food is excellent, the decorations are pretty cool. It's a neat little bar and restaurant. If you can get out here, it's uh, worth, worth the drive from Henderson. Hope you enjoy service with Pastor Diane. We'll see you soon. Thank you, Phil. Welcome to Worship at Christ, a servant from our living room to yours. We are honored that you've chosen to worship with us in this way today. So turn up the volume and let's get started. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. We pray together. Dear Father, I ask you to give me strength to live this day as you would have me live it. Guide me in shining with the light of Jesus Christ in my words and actions. Fill me with your Spirit so that I may be for others an instrument of hope, peace, and love. Use me to bring joy to others so that they may understand the life you desire for all your children. Amen. God hears your prayer and fills you with the power to live today, tomorrow, and every day, enjoying new and abundant life. Live in newness of life. Amen? Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. So last weekend, we had what is a very fun annual event at Christ the Servant. We had the annual trunk or treat, and we had a lot of people who volunteered to decorate the backs of their cars, and then some others who were hosts to also hand out candy at the tables. We really appreciate all of the candy that was donated, and we had such a very good time. Our first reading is from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31 through 34. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No longer sh shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So this is the weekend that we remember the Reformation. Now this was, the Reformation was considered to begin when Martin Luther uh, had come to know more and more about God's grace and forgiveness. He gained a new perspective of what was already in the, both the Old and the New Testament. And he wanted to share that with others. He thought that somehow in his own day, uh, things had got off track. So the church had got a bit off track. So he shared some ideas on October 31st, the evening before All Saints Day, because a lot of people would show up at church. So he puts his list of ideas up on the church. 
and he thought that would just spark a, a good kind of sharing, some healthy sharing of, of ideas. Instead, it ended up being the catalyst for something that caused a lot of change, even a great deal of um, division, unfortunately, for the church. But the good news is, over time, I think there's greater understanding and a lot of that we still have a way as Christians of liking to splinter off and keep breaking into other smaller groups. But also I will say that that big division that goes back to the time of what Martin Luther shared has come a long way, that there's a lot more that is agreed upon. Well, the Bible readings for today are related to the celebration of Reformation and each one has a insight to give to us about a new relationship with God. Here in Jeremiah, God's people had been suffering. They had been in exile for quite a long time. A lot of Jeremiah's message had pointed out to why they deserved to be in that exile, why they had been taken from their homeland and had to live in a foreign land almost to the point of despair, almost actually losing hope. Would they ever go back again? Well, that was the message now that Jeremiah had to share with God's people, that there would be a return. They would, there would be a homecoming. There would be that sense of belonging and having that people, their own place, their own people, their own worship. They would be back to their homeland one day. And while this is talking in terms of a, of a new covenant, that God will bring a new covenant, there is that image of hope and promise in this. And it's just a few words, they're not fancy words, but these words are after those days, after those days, after the time of the exile is done, after the people have made it back to to Israel, back home again. And we heard last week in the Bible reading, if you recall, that everyone gets there together. Uh, no one would be left behind. They would all journey together to get back once this after those days part had, had come to its completion. And that there will be an, another layer in the many times God has made special promises to God's people. God has been in a covenant relationship with God's people. Actually, you could say it goes back even as far as all people, all the way back to Noah and Abraham and Moses and King David. And then here is another layer in those many special promises of a continuing relationship, an ongoing relationship God has with God's people. But this is another layer, and it says it's not like the one, this new covenant is not like the one that was made when there was give, the one given in Sinai. That was in just when it was the exile, they had just escaped slavery in Egypt, and then God gave them some especially good guidance on how to be God's people together, because they were probably very out of practice after being slaves for hundreds of years how to live as a people together without somebody else telling them the rules. The Egyptians had told them certain rules, I'm sure, for a long time. Well, God says, hey, I have some better rules for you to follow, and they're, they're good ones. They actually make it possible for you to live in community with one another and also in a close relationship with, with me, with your God. Well, the thing is, though, they failed. We still fail. We still don't always keep the Ten Commandments, most certainly. But the promise in the new covenant is that God is going to overcome the brokenness. God is going to overcome the distance. And there won't be a need for, as there was before in Sinai, where Moses had to be the go-between. There had to be an intermediary. Instead, God is going to be in a very direct connection, direct relationship with each and every person. Even though they are still a people together, a community, there will be that unique and special connection, personal connection. And in that connection, God will bring the guidance, bring the direction straight into our hearts is the promise. And also there will be forgiveness. And that forgiveness, when God says, I will forgive their iniquity their, and remember their sin no more. You know, there's that saying you might have heard, forgive and forget. And I will say, so often as humans, that's just not something we can pull off. We may, we may 
actually be able to forgive. And a lot of times it takes God's help for us to be able to forgive when we've been wronged. But the forgetting part, I sometimes wonder if only God can actually do the forgetting part. But that's, that's the good news that's given to us, that God promises to make that new and everlasting connection and that will always be in our, inside of us internally as we understand the Holy Spirit is within us to guide us, to strengthen us, to en encourage our faith in our following of Jesus Christ and to always remind us the assurance that through Jesus we are forgiven. Our psalm today is from Psalm 46, which is the psalm that inspired Martin Luther in writing the hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the mountains shake in the depths of the sea, though its waters rage and foam and though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, it shall not be shaken. God shall help it at the break of day. The nations rage and the kingdoms shake, God speaks and the earth melts away. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come now, regard the works of the Lord, what desolations God has brought upon the earth. Behold the one who makes war to cease in all the world, who breaks the bow and shatters the spear and burns the shields with fire. Be still then and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. I think I in part understand why Martin Luther was especially drawn to this psalm because in his own time and especially for his own uh, personal safety, he, he did feel under threat because after he shared his ideas that he had grown into from further uh, immersing himself, getting to know more and more what, what the Bible had to share about how God does show mercy and especially how God shows grace for us and forgiveness for us through what Jesus Christ has done for us. And he thought, well, that something was missing and it will be understood. People will be happy once I, you know, bring it to light again, help it be known again. Well, that wasn't exactly the reaction. And so he faced a lot of trials. He faced a lot of tribulation. And in many ways, in other, it also became tumultuous time. So things were kind of shaky. And in the midst of that shakiness, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. So different times of life, different events in life, it could be both in a personal uh, health situation or losing a job or something that uh, sets off and makes our normally perhaps um, balanced, relatively balanced life to be kind of rocking back and forth. And then in the same time to know that there is our God is with us so that God is always there for us and that we can always look to God and rely on God and that while everything around us might be going like this, you know, kind of going, whoa, what's happening? There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. So there is a promise here in the midst of this message that many times, yeah, life gets shaky, things get out of balance. But when we keep our eyes on God and we remember that God is for us and that God is also close to us, I like that in a sense too, that this psalm is a reminder of God's closeness. God is not far off, but God is very near, a very present help in trouble. So when we face those shaky times in life, this is such a great psalm to return to and uh, maybe even pull out a hymnal or look up a version of singing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, and be reminded that we have a God who is faithful, we have a God who is steadfast, we have a God who is trustworthy, we have a God who is on our side. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold.
Our next reading is from Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through 28. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works, no, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. So as I had said a little earlier, Martin Luther, in his own delving into God's word, both the Old Testament and the New Testament, but in particular, some parts of the New Testament, he kind of had this, his own reformation, his own um, awakening, enlightenment, or whatever you want to call it, his own aha, that's what, that's what God means, that's what God wants us to know. And this part in Romans was definitely one of those kind of key portions of the scripture that really spoke to him in a new way, because Luther himself had grown up with the kind of teaching of his time in the church that he was a miserable sinner. He was very, very bad. He was, perhaps you want to even go so far as say evil, and that in order to make himself right with God, he would have to have to suffer. He would have to make penance. He would have to uh, try to prove uh, both, both in punishment and in doing good deeds to make himself right with God. He would have to kind of earn his way into God's good grace, earn his way into salvation. And so as he read more of the scripture and then in one instance coming along this particular passage, it was that kind of like amazement and awareness that that wasn't what was expected, that wasn't what God was saying to us, that we have to scrabble and crawl and you know, do every effort of our own part, and, and it's strenuous and it's hard in order for us to be made right with God, that it's something of a, like a big, um, what do they call it, huge quest, one of those great, you know, huge quests in a story. No, but it's something that Jesus Christ. Now, the thing is, though, different times and different places, we as humans have been sometimes maybe taken on too much guilt, uh, over overdone the issue about our sinfulness, but then sometimes we've been mm, also likely to try to ignore it. In other words, I think in general, as human beings, we can be very good at justifying our choices and our actions and even our words. You know, we want to defend what we did. We want to make ourselves look good. Uh, so, so again, that phrase, just you want to justify yourself. You want to show why that was what you had to do or why you were the, that was the right, that you were right, you know, and others were wrong. So the thing is, though, that's part of the falling short. That's trying to put ourselves in the very center and really keep thinking only about ourselves and making ourselves look in the best possible light. Now, again, on the other hand, I think, unfortunately, Luther had fallen into the other extreme, which was not so much um, justifying, you know, like raising up his own sense of goodness uh, above what was actual, but he had perhaps overemphasized his own 
sense of sinfulness. Yes, we are broken. Yes, we are sinners. But I don't think God ever wants us to be groveling in guilt. You know, when God created the world, God said, and it is good. Yes, sin comes in and yes, we mess up and yes, we hurt God or we go against God and we go against others and we even go against ourselves. And the law is there. That's part of what Romans is, what it does say. You know, the law helps us shine the light and hopefully shows us the truth. And so whether we're thinking, you know, we're um, the worst sinners in the world or whether we think, well, I've never sinned in my whole life. You know, the law is there to kind of help us with the truth and facing the truth and knowing, as it says, we all fall short. We all fall short. And I think that's something that I think just about anyone can understand. You don't even have to use the word sin. We all have that awareness. We all understand that sense in our lives at times like, yeah, I fell short. I fell short. And yet now we have this gift of a new relationship, a restored relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's not something that 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 rift, that brokenness is not something that we can overcome, but it is something that Christ does help heal. It is something that only Jesus can un overcome for our sake. And so Jesus is where God meets us, where the divine meets the human, and where God forgives us and heals that relationship that we broke and brings us back into a good and right relationship. It may be, we could think of it as a pronouncement of being, you're not guilty, but I think of it also even more so about a restored relationship and that it's a gift. It's not something that we accomplish, but trusting in what Jesus does for us and living in thankfulness and in sharing God's love with others. Our gospel reading is from John chapter 8, verse 31 through 36. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying, You will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household, the Son has a place there forever. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I've always liked that particular verse, that last verse 36. So if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. Well, there's the words, key words like truth and being free. And the thing is though, those aren't just broad generic terms. They have a very special meaning and particularly because of being connected with Jesus in relationship to Jesus. So it's not just any old truth. It's this truth, again, in this relationship, in this connection with Jesus. I have to admit, I've read this passage in multiple times, probably, well, year after year after year. We do hear this on uh, the end of October. Every year we hear this, this same passage from John's Gospel. And I've studied uh, in John's gospel, I don't know, a, a certain number of times with Bible study. So it's not as if this is um, a brand new Bible passage that I somehow haven't hardly enc encountered very much at all. It's one I've seen many times. But I think what kind of stood out to me somewhat this time is to be reminded sometimes in the gospels, there are times when Jesus is encountering Jewish, Jewish leaders or certain Jews, just certain of the Jews. And there is a bit of animosity. And I think I had carried over from some of those occasions that are reported in, in the gospels into this particular event. And here, if I'm being more careful, read a little more slowly, I have now realized it says, he said to the Jews who had believed in him, they are already wanting to follow Jesus. They are already 
wanting to be in relationship with Jesus. They are already wanting to, I'd say, put their trust in Jesus. And so he's actually, initially, I think he's just trying to encourage them in that direction to go on in that, can keep going that way. And so he says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. So again, the truth is not just any truth. It's a, it's a specific truth and we'll, we'll get to that, but continue in my word, continue in my word. Um, that's, there's so many little catchphrases in John's gospel, but continue, remain, be connected with, and so that is a very key idea. It's about being connected with Jesus, being in a trusting relationship, being in a loving relationship with Jesus, putting our reliance in him. And in my word, all right, see now there's another one of those big kind of catch words in John's gospel. In our Bible passage, it uses the, the little w, the small w. But if you recall the very beginning, of the whole gospel begins with the phrase, in the beginning was the word, capital, I don't know if I can do that, capital W, in the beginning was the word, and the word, capital W, was with God, and the word was God. And uh, throughout that first chapter of, of John's gospel, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, again, capital W. And that is Jesus himself. That is what Jesus is, God's very word, the word made flesh, has come and lives among us, is with us, right in our midst. And so this word is both Jesus himself. So it's his whole life. It's all that, all that he does, all that he says, and especially all that he does, including his going to the cross, dying for us, and rising again, and returning to heaven, so that he can then be present everywhere with all of us every time and every place. So there's, that's a big picture, but it is the word is Jesus himself. Jesus is God's best message. So continuing in our knowing Jesus, being in relationship with Jesus, he says, you will know the truth. You will know the truth. And again, this is just not some philosophical understanding. Well, what is that? What is truth? That's what uh, Pontius Pilate asked Jesus later in the gospel. What is truth? Well, Jesus himself later in later than this says something, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You will know the truth is not like a computer that you can push a few buttons on a keyboard and have it share a whole bunch of information with you. Uh, print out a whole bunch of data, a whole bunch of facts. Knowing the truth is knowing in the sense of having a connection, having a personal relationship. Like you know a person, you know your friend, you know your parents, you know your children, you know your neighbors. It's a personal connection. And that's knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is what actually gives us guidance. It's an ongoing relationship. And Jesus is the one who makes us free. Jesus is the one who frees us from sin and death. Jesus is the one who frees us to be able to live as God's own beloved children. And he frees us to be able to share that same love and forgiveness as it says in John's gospel, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, knows him, is connected with him, trusts him, follows him, whoever believes in him will have the fullness of life. Longing for God's will to be fulfilled among us, we pray for the church, the world, and all people in need. Holy God, work in your church across denominational and cultural divisions to form us into a more complete expression of your holy people. Lord, show the world your likeness through us. Lord, we give you praise for you always hear us. By rain, rivers, and oceans, remind us how your word flows through this world. Surround us with grace. Keep us always in the covenant that is sealed in water and spirit. Lord, we give you praise 
for you always hear us. Be a stronghold for people who are in danger this day. In your righteous presence, cause the evil that surrounds them to flee and clothe them with your mercy. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Continue making all things new. Seal your covenant with humankind and write your law on our hearts. Make repentance something that we do continually so that forgiveness abounds. Lord, we give you praise, for you always hear us. Enfold all things in your compassion, O God, and bring us into your life through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Lift our hearts in worship, praise ascending. To you all honor, glory never ending. Majesty surrounds you everlasting. Voices join together, start to sing. Praising you forever and forever. We're praising you forever and forever. Ascending to you, all honor, glory, never ending. Majesty surrounds you, everlasting voices join together, start to sing, praising you forever and forever, we're praising you forever and forever. Ascending to you, all honor, glory, never ending. Majesty surrounds you, everlasting voices join together, start. See. The peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you.
please join in speaking these words. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Stay in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll worship together again next week.